right. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Kayleen Bryson. I am a science community member and I host the Evenings of Enology episodes here with the science community. This is Barry Jackson. Evening. Uh, Barry Jackson, oh, we're telling more followers to join your video. Excellent. <laughs> um, Barry Jackson is the winemaker for Equinox Winery, which is where we're at right now. Um, behind us, we have a riddling rack, which we'll talk about more um, in the interview. But remember that this is a a live Instagram video. So um, we encourage you to ask questions. We encourage you to really engage. Um, this Barry is a wizard with sparkling wine. He's been doing sparkling wine for almost, can I say how long? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for almost two decades. So um, this is not his first rodeo. Um, and we have a lot of really awesome nerdy things to talk about. Um, so please send your questions in. I'll be not jotting them down here on the computer and trying to answer them in real time. Um, so let's get started. Um, so who is Barry Jackson? Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, winemaker, owner winemaker for Equinox Champagne Cellars here in Santa Cruz, along with my wife Jennifer. And uh, we've been producing Equinox since 1989. And uh, we opened our permanent winery home on the west side of Santa Cruz in 2006. And we're a uh, podcast, the Instagram, whatever is from our tasting room and aging cellar on the west side of Santa Cruz here on Ingalls Street. And uh, the boxes you see behind me have aging champagne bottles. And uh, part of the long tradition of sparkling wine is that it goes back a long time. And the boxes behind me were built by the Mirasu Winery Cellar Crew in 1962. Whoa, so they are cool. older than that. most of the people watching <laughs> this podcast. Probably. Um, where did you grow up, Barry? Are you from the Santa Cruz area? Nope. Grew up in the Central Valley in Fresno. Went to Fresno State. Uh, graduated. Worked in big wineries. Got a job that brought me to the Bay Area. Fresno's a nice place to be from. I enjoy living in Santa Cruz now. <laughs> if you're from California, you probably get that joke. <laughs> um, so when did you start in the wine industry? And when did you know you wanted to do winemaking full-time? Uh, wine industry, oh, hey, per Amy. se. <laughs> uh, well, started uh, making wine at Fresno State while I was a college student there and got involved in uh, actually doing some sparkling wine, some champagne projects there, and uh, essentially put myself through school working in uh, wine shops. And uh, when I graduated my college degree, I went to work at a big Central Valley winery dragging hoses and being called College Boy a lot. <laughs> oh, a lot of hose dragging wineries. Um, and how long have you been making sparkling wine in particular? Well, our first vintage of Equinox was 1989. Hey, Andy. And uh, <laughs> we got to uh, ride out the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake with our first vintage. Happened Can you tell everybody what the Loma Prieta earthquake was? There's a oh. lot of people not from California here. Okay. In, uh, well, it was October 17th, 5.04 p.m. Uh, the uh, San Andreas Fault decided it was time to release some pressure. And the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, which I think ended up being registered as a 6.5, uh, kind of tore up Santa Cruz County. Uh, I was at uh, Steve Storrs Winery in the Sash Mill in downtown Santa Cruz, and uh, it was pretty exciting. Watched uh, full wine barrels bounce around like ping pong balls in the lottery cage. Watched half yeah. my uh, first vintage uh, spray against the ceiling in Storrs Winery and rain down, you know. Yeah, it was rough. And uh, go down the drain. And the part that didn't go down the drain, we bottled and decided not to take that as a sign and persevered and continued. <laughs> decided to take a giant earthquake crashing all of my wine as not a sign. Good move. You did, you did well. Um, so again, engage, please ask any questions. Um, but what is the history behind sparkling wine berries? Typically, or sorry, um, and here I'm referring to the traditional method of champagne making sparkling wine. Okay. so. Talking about the Method Champenois, the Champagne method, where the effervescence uh, in the wine is captured in each individual bottle. And uh, depending upon who you ask, uh, it either started in the very late 1660s or in the early to middle 1700s. Uh, but it was a uh, accepted style of wine uh, by the early 1800s and uh, was considered a, a luxury good even then. Uh, so it's been around for quite a while. 
uh, but the traditional method of doing the second fermentation that creates the effervescence is sort of the core essence of the method champenoise and sparkling may, wines made in that method. So what defines a sparkling wine in general? Um, because I think a lot of things that people don't realize is that um, people in the wine industry will oftentimes refer to wines as sparkling wines because not all wines are champagne. So this is kind of, if you're like a biochemist, this is sort of like enzymes and proteins, right? So um, all, um, all proteinaceous enzymes are protein, but not all enzymes are protein and vice versa, right? Um, and so when we think about sparkling wine, we differentiate between a lot of kinds of sparkling wine, um, whether that's Prosecco or Champagne or American sparkling wine, um, Pet Nat. So what is sparkling wine by definition? Uh, it's an official tax class that allows the government to charge us a lot more than for still wine. <laughs> yeah, how much, how much, what's the difference on the tax rate there? Uh, for sparkling versus well, still, it's the, insane. Well, with the new, the new tax code that just went in, that they're slowly unraveling, just like everything else that issues from Washington. Uh, we are saving actually about a dollar a gallon as a small producer, which we were not able to claim before. The, previously, the tax rate on sparkling wine uh, was $3.40 a gallon, which is 20 times the tax rate of 17 cents a gallon, which is the tax rate for most small wineries. 20 times the tax rate, sparkling wine versus still wine. And you guys wonder why it's so expensive. Uh, <laughs> a lot of reasons why it's expensive, though. Well, so... The tax rate on sparkling wine is the same regardless of its, uh, its production method. So back to your question, uh, the, the primary methods for making wine sparkling in, in a commercial sense is the method you champenoise, can. which we employ and it, it's what they do in Champagne, that's why they call it Champagne. Uh, and there's what is referred to as the Charmat process, named after the French gentleman that developed in the very late 1800s or also known as the bulk process. Uh, and that has yeah. to appear on the label. And the bulk process is essentially, it's a second fermentation in a large pressure vessel where the CO2 is captured in the pressure vessel instead of in the individual bottle. And then the wines are bottled uh, in a system that maintains that pressure level, that CO2 that's generated by the second fermentation. It's a natural yeast fermentation. Uh, the systems themselves are quite expensive because they're designed to operate at high pressure in the 100 PSI range, or three times that by the design specs. And, uh, but once you have the expensive system, you can make sparkling wine in a very short period of time. The Method Champenoise, uh, as it's defined in France, uh, the wine has to be aged in the bottle for a minimum of two years, and three years if it's a, a vintage dated wine. So. Uh, Two or three years versus two or three months, maybe. Yes. And I, I know from personal experience in a galaxy far away and a <laughs> long time ago, uh, you can make sparkling wine via the Charmat process in five days if you go after it and put that in mind. So, um, Kyle, I so Kyle contacted me a couple of days ago before this um, Instagram asking this question, and I did put it on my list, Kyle, um, but I wanna answer it right now in case you have to like peace out and do something. Um, and you were kind of touching on it a little bit, Barry. Um, and again, hi, people who've just joined. Um, we encourage you to ask as many questions as you want. Um, Kyle asked, um, he's back up in the feed now, but um, um, basically, and this is a very hard question to answer succinctly, but how does sparkling wine get its bubbles? Okay. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I will be as succinct as possible. Sparkling wine gets its bubbles from a second fermentation, uh, either in so the what bottle. Do you, so you're referring to a second fermentation. Okay. What is the first fermentation okay. even? I'll go to the beginning. So the, the grapes are harvested, the juice is pressed out. The primary fermentation is the alcoholic fermentation that takes grape juice and yeast uh, metabolize that sugar, they produce alcohol and CO2 and a little bit of other things. That's the primary fermentation. It's the alcoholic fermentation. And what do you get at the end of that? Well, you have a, a, a still wine and that is that is the end of the fermentation process for most wines at that point. They're then either going to go, they're going to be barreled down to age for a while 
or they're going to be blended. If they're white wines and they're not intended to age for any length of time, they may be blended and, and bottled up in a fairly short period of time. Uh, so that's, you know, grape to wine, primary fermentation. Mm -hmm. So for sparkling wines, we take the base wine that has undergone the primary fermentation where we've done the, the grape sugar to alcohol and CO2 conversion, and all the carbon dioxide in the primary fermentation escapes. For the second fermentation, we are going to uh, take our base wine, or cuvee is the French term, and uh, we're going to, we might blend it with other wines, we may take a single wine, and we are going to uh, build up a yeast culture of a very specific type of, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae bianus. Those are the champagne yeast, and they have a number of... Is that genus species strain? Yeah. Okay. They, uh, they have characteristics that lend themselves to sparkling wine production. Uh, they can ferment under pressure, they ferment at higher alcohol, uh, they ferment in nutrient depleted mediums, and in fact, one of the commercial yeasts uh, that we use is also recommended for starting stuck fermentations, which is a primary fermentation that has not consumed all the original grape sugar. Which is a pain. Yeah, for which the is a real pain. It's a huge and pain in it's, it's how all late harvest Zinfandels start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're like, shit, it's not moving anymore. <laughs> I guess we're done. <laughs> so, uh, we're gonna, the, the second fermentation that creates the effervescence in sparkling wines is uh, started uh, with a, a yeast culture, uh, a commercial yeast culture if you're, if you're engaged in commercial winemaking. And uh, the, the yeast consume the sugar, they create a little bit more alcohol, and they create carbon dioxide. And so in the sparkling wines and the champagne method, that carbon dioxide from the second fermentation is captured in each individual bottle. So the bottles are capped at this point and there's yeast inside the bottles. Yes. Yes, the bottles have a crown cap like you'd see on a on a beer bottle or a old-fashioned soda, and uh, and the CO2 is retained, captured uh, in each individual bottle. In the the bulk process, the Charmat process, that second yeast fermentation takes place in a pressure tank, and the CO2 is is captured in that pressure tank, and then the wine will be bottled uh, through a system that maintains the the ambient pressure inside the tank, uh, somewhere in the 80 to 90 pounds per square inch range. If I was good at math, I'd give you the kilograms per square centimeter, but it, it would be math, stupid. Math is hard. Math is so hard. So, uh, <laughs> although it would be in the neighborhood of about uh, six and a half to seven atmospheres of pressure, or bar, if you're speaking European. If that's your jam. So, uh, the... The sparkle in sparkling wines is effervescence derived from a second yeast fermentation. So how then do you keep the bubbles in the wine if, if so you have this bottle that has yeast in it and wine in it that's going through a secondary fermentation where you add yeast in that can handle that environment of high pressure. Um, you still have to get the classic cork that you pop off when you're opening champagne in there, right? So how is it that we keep the bubbles in there? Because this is a cool process. Um, and can you explain what this process is called? Okay. And how we retain those bubbles while swapping out tops. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit for a minute about the, the stages of Champagne Method sparkling wine production, also known in France now as Méthode Traditionnelle, because they got tired of us using the Champagne, or Méthode Champenoise word, and they want it to be specific to them. Fair. And if, and if you want to say champagne, it's okay to annoys my French friends, <laughs> whom I love dearly. <laughs> for the record, yeah. I also love my French friends, too. <laughs> so and for, wine. for sparkling wine production, uh, for the Method Champenoise, there's several steps that we go through. So we've, we've done the primary fermentation where the grape juice, the grapes have been pressed off, the juice is fermented. We have still wine, and still wine means no bubbles. We're going to take the still wine, we may blend it, we're going to filter it and make it ready for the yeast and the sugar for the second uh, fermentation to create the effervescence. Uh, the French term for this, and we, we use a lot of champagne terms that don't have a real English translation, and so we, we use them because it describes what we're doing. So this bottling for the second fermentation to commence is called the tirage. 
And I, tirage. Uh, tirage. T i r a g e, <laughs> not triage. Very different. Very different. <laughs> yeah. uh, triage comes later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you're writing and you have a spell check on your system, make sure you check because there was an article several years ago written by a well-respected wine writer hey, writing from about Connecticut. sparkling wine, and her spell check fixed tirage to triage 20 times. Oh, no. <laughs> and it got published. Everyone knew what she meant, but it was what embarrassing sucks. nonetheless. Oh, God. So, poor, and I've, poor I was, child. I've been told by a native French speaker who teaches French to hey. Anglophones, uh, tirage means was from the verb to pull. So in some way, we're pulling the bubbles out of the wine. Anyway, the tirage fill initiates the second fermentation. The period of time... Okay, so the second fermentation, the, t the, the tirage, uh, depending upon ambient conditions, if the cellar is warmer, that second fermentation will take place over a shorter period of time. It's physics. Warmer, faster. If the cellar's colder, it's going to take a little bit longer. But the second fermentation is generally going to com be complete somewhere in about probably... 12 to 24 weeks under normal circumstances. Okay. At that point, the effervescence level in each of those bottles or the or the pressure tank if you're doing the Charmat process is going to be at its maximum. It's 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 not going to go up. Uh, whatever handling we do is probably going to diminish it to a small degree. At this point for the champagne method, the bottles are now going to age for roughly two years, 18 to 24 months. And so again, all the boxes you see behind me here, these are aging champagne bottles. They're laying on their sides. So all the yeast sediment is spread out on one side of the bottle. They're sealed with a, with a crown cap. Like a beer cap. Yeah, like we see on a, you know, a bottle of beer. So the, uh, the wines, while it's sitting there, the yeast are viable for about 12 months or so. So at the end of that second fermentation, if we took some of those yeast out, we could add them to a nutrient source and they would start to ferment again. So part of the aging process is to allow the yeast cells to, to basically die off. And as they, as they die off, they break down and they release the intracellular matter, which is proteins. And that's what contributes the yeasty, toasty aroma to uh, bottle fermented sparkling wines. The longer you leave the spent yeast in the bottle, the more flavor and aroma you're gonna get. And we'll get around to that. Those are called lees. Yeah. So that is, there's the initial tirage to start the second fermentation. There's the aging period. And pretty much while the wine's aging, it's, it's sitting. Uh, at the end of the aging period, now is where the next production step takes place. And for bottle fermented sparkling wines, champagne, method champenois sparkling wines, the yeast sediment is in the bottle, and we are going. We need to remove the yeast sediment uh, from the bottle and keep the wine and the fizz in the bottle. The first step is the very approximate English translation is to riddle the wine. The French term is rimouage, and I haven't had enough wine to have that come out halfway clear. But it's it's the riddling process. Yeah. <laughs> And this is the process by which the bottles go through a series of rotational motions and a change in angle from being roughly horizontal to not vertical, but at a very steep angle. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. This is Barry's wine, by the way. What are we drinking, Barry? Uh, this is our vintage 2001 Blanc de Blanc extended tirage from the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, grapes that were grown in the Trout Gulch Vineyard in the mountains above Aptos. 2001. How long was this entourage? Uh, well, we aged this with the yeast sediment in the bottle for 15 years. And we do pour 15 this. 15 years, and you wonder why it's expensive. And we do pour this as part of our tasting flight at the winery on a regular basis. Truth. So. Okay, riddling. Sorry. So, this is the process to transfer the yeast sediment uh, into the neck of the bottle. And the bottles behind us, they're riddled. So all the sediment has been collected in the neck. Uh, it's fairly compact. I'd bring a bottle over to show you, but the bottles, they're, they're an amber color and they're really hard to see through. And uh, trust me, they're 
all the sediment is down in the neck of the bottle. So, so we're describing here, if for those of you who have just joined, um, there, there's a question of how do you get bubbles in wine and then in champagne and sparkling wine, and how do you keep them in there? Because you're doing a secondary fermentation in a bottle that has a crown cap, which Barry's gonna show you here. So, um, and you gotta get that crown cap off and put a champagne cork in. So how in the world do you get all of the yeast out, keep the bubbles in, and put a new closure on top? Okay, so the riddling process, the racks behind me, these bottles are turned individually by hand a couple times a day. And Such this a is, pain. This is the traditional process. And we do this for one of the wineries we work with because, I don't know if you can tell, this is a beautiful bowling pin shaped bottle. It's lovely, everyone loves it. Uh, it doesn't work in our automated system, so we have to do it by hand. And I'll withhold any judgmental statements at this point. <laughs> Yeah, dude, it is so cool, right? <laughs> by the way, hi, Marika. I saw you. Hi, so, Jess. Hey, Andy. I have all your questions, by the way, right here. Okay, so once the wines have been riddled, all the yeast sediment is now collected down here in the neck of the bottle against the crown cap. So that's the whole, the riddling process is to accumulate that sediment here in the neck of the bottle so we can remove it. So that's the riddling process. Large commercial wineries have automated systems that do this. We do, too. Uh, but again, we, we hand riddle this particular bottle because it doesn't work in the machine. So the next step is the removal of the yeast, topping up the bottle, putting the cork and the wire in. And this is the process called disgorging or degorgement. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take these bottles and we're going to put them neck down in a freezing solution. And what gonna, is that freezing solution? Uh, it is a food grade glycol. Uh, some systems use uh, calcium chloride. Okay. Uh, basically, you know, a freezing brine. Uh, Does anybody use like liquid nitrogen or like dry ice or any combination they, of those things? They have developed uh, systems that use liquid nitrogen. Uh, they're not for the small vintner. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure they're really freaking expensive. Um, <laughs> I know at one point we did a very uh, hastily arranged and ultimately ill-conceived experiment uh, with a Dewar's bottle at the end of a still wine bottling at a friend's winery and we tried neck freezing with liquid nitrogen and uh, let me suffice it to say it did not go well. No wine was enjoyed that night. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna freeze about this much wine in the neck of the bottle. That allows us to remove the bottle and turn the bottle upright which I can't do because I haven't frozen the neck on this one yet. Right. So now the contents that are in the, in the top of the bottle that we got to the top by a process called riddling where you very slowly turn the yeast around in bottle and get them back into the neck are frozen. So the bottle's upright, the ice is holding the sediment in place against the crown cap. At this point in large commercial wineries, this is all done by robots now. In very small producers, uh, it's done by hand. Uh, we do this disgorging process one bottle at a time by hand. We use a tool, we pop the crown off the bottle, the pressure in the bottle shoots the sediment out of the bottle uh, with a little bit of the frozen wine. At this point the bottle is open and this is the point where champagne making, sparkling wine making is very interesting because as the vintner you now have an opportunity to tinker with the wine one more time. So at the very least we're gonna we're gonna top that bottle up with some of the same wine to replace that which has been lost in the disgorging process, which isn't very much. It, it's generally 1%, 1.5%. And uh, if we do it properly and the circumstances are optimum, uh, we lose very little pressure uh, in the bottle. You know, out of the 90 to 100 PSI, we might lose maybe 10 PSI. <laughs> Marika, mind equals blown. <laughs> That's awesome. So. Uh, at this point, when the bottle is open, we're going to top it up. At this point, we can add uh, a little bit of a, a, a finishing uh, sugar syrup made out of still wine and cane sugar to adjust the final finish on the wine. Because again, uh, sparkling wines are made from grapes that are picked at lower sugar levels and higher acidity. Which we're going to talk about later, potentially. And so, uh, we can balance out that naturally high acidity, and that, the crispness, uh, with a little bit of sweetness. Uh, we can, or we can leave it completely dry. Yep. Uh, 
if we want to add a little bit of brandy for some sort of aromatic or mouthfeel aspect, we can do that. Uh, if we want to make rosé, we can do that. Uh, mm. there, there are many, uh, many creative opportunities at this point. Uh, you have to have considered them and be ready to implement them. It's not something you do on the fly. <laughs> yeah. At least not consistently or well. Yeah, right. Like, so I'm losing all my bubbles right now. Let's make a decision right now. <laughs> so once the wine has been disgorged, it's been topped up, it's been dosed, and the, the material, the very long French name for the sugar syrup that might be added that may or may not have brandy is called the liqueur de expedition. Uh, and we typically refer to it as the dosage syrup or the dosage material or just the dose or the dosage. Uh, and the sweetness level that you can, that you're looking for in a sparkling wine that's, that's finished what we would call nature or au naturel, uh, the sweetness level is zero. So we're not adding any, any syrup to adjust that final finish. Uh, the, the brute level uh, is what you usually see in the better sparkling wines is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of around, oh, six tenths of... You can say grams per liter. Okay, it's around between six and ten grams per liter. Well, that's really high, actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, most of our wines are well below that. Uh, sometimes you'll see wines labeled as ultra brute that will have wines that are somewhere between, oh, two and four uh, grams per liter. Okay. Uh, you'll see other, other terms for the sweetness level or the finish on the wines there's extra dry, uh, and these are all made up marketing terms. There's no legal definition. So extra dry is actually quite sweet. So it's a marketing term, so it makes sense that it makes it's no so sense at all. It's so freaking stupid. Like, I wish, I'm going to jump on my high horse for like just a second. I really wish that America had better regimes on how they market sparkling wine. It's already confusing enough as is for people, and then you like, it's extra brute, but that means it's actually sweet, and then it's like, what the fuck? I don't know. Sorry. Off my high horse, back to science. Okay. Anyway. So we can adjust the final finish on the wine with the dosage syrup or none at all. Uh, at that point, and there's usually a little bit of uh, uh, SO2 in the solutions. We're adding a little bit of an antioxidant, uh, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 to 40 parts per million okay. measured as total as added per bottle. Uh, at this point, the wine has been topped up. The fill point has been, you know, corrected. It's ready for the champagne cork and the wire. Uh, again, in our operation, we do most of this work by hand. Uh, in larger winery operations, the bottles may go through a bottle washer and then on to labeling and capsuling and finishing and packing off. Mm -hmm. We do these in separate steps. But in terms of the, the, coming, the, the physical, the primary operations involved in the production of the wine, initially there's the tirage fill, there's the aging period, there's the riddling, there's the disgorging and corking. And those are the operational steps that are the, at, at the core of taking and making the wine ready to go to the consumer, to the shelf, to your dinner table, to the restaurant. Um, so Jessica asked, are there any advantages and can you control the rate of doing tirage fast or slow? Uh, you can control the conditions uh, Generally, you want your tirage uh, at a, you want a little bit longer fermentation for the tirage taking place at a, a lower temperature. Uh, generally, warmer, faster fermentations uh, result in wines that are less fruity. And at least part of what we're trying- So what's happening there scientifically? Like at a high, like what kind of byproducts are you making? I don't know. Okay. But it leads to like less well, fruit character, like the, yeah. I mean, it hot, oxidize? Is it like no hot fermentations generally are? If you if you do blind tastings or where you have uh, three samples, two are the same and one is different, uh, the 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 warmer fermentations generally have uh, aromatic and and flavor differences that are perceived as being less good rather than than better, and. Uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at any of that stuff, and I know that the, the research uh, has been expanded, uh, but we still ferment, you know, white wine in stainless steel tanks mm -hmm. at low temperatures because they generally taste better. And there are a thousand exceptions that... There's uh, always a thousand exceptions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so 
Um, Kyle asked, does age matter in sparkling wines, i.e., does it lose bubbles as a function of time? Um, in the broadest sense, yes. So when the, at the end of the, the second fermentation, the tirage, okay, the, the effervescence level, the pressure in the bottle, the tank, whatever, it's at a maximum. And so while, while champagne method sparkling wines are aging, uh, they're sealed with a crown cap. And there's also a, 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 a second closure that's actually underneath the crown. It's a little plastic, it looks like a little plastic thimble. It's called a bidule. And it actually helps to seal the bottle. It doesn't hold much pressure, but it acts like an O-ring to help seal the bottle and the crown cap holds the bidule in. Both of these are good closures, they're not perfect closures. So over an extended period of time, say, six, seven, eight years, you are going to lose some of your effervescence level in a bottle sealed with a crown. But it's a better seal over a longer period of time than the cork. So sparkling wines, once the cork goes in the bottle, they're pretty much ready to go. Uh, a better wine stored under optimum conditions, you know, cool cellar, maybe stored inside, keep the cork moist. Uh, is going to maintain an effervescence level over a longer period of time as opposed to something that's standing up underneath the sink next to the dishwasher. Yeah. Which was where one of my wife's friends stored one of our bottles for an extended period of time and then oh, no. wasn't happy with it. But uh, that's another story. Anyway. And then they come in like, why does my wine <coughs> Anyway. So. <laughs> Don't do that to your wine. Uh, they didn't do anything bad to you. So once the, once the cork goes in, uh, the, the clock is ticking on the effervescence level. Uh, younger wines that don't age as long are going to, obviously, they're going to be more effervescent in the glass, in the bottle, as opposed to something that's aged for an extended period of time uh, with a crown cap and a yeast in the bottle. Uh, so the, the effervescence level is going to change over time. It's going to and change. And it's going to decrease in it's, general. It's going to decrease. Um, if it increases, uh, you got yeast left over in your bottle. <laughs> yeah, not you, good. Well, no, you've had a, you've had a tertiary fermentation, and your bottle's going to be cloudy, and everybody's going to be unhappy. Uh, and I've mm. seen that on occasion, but not with any of our wines. Good job. Um, someone asked who the we are. Um, just really briefly, I'm Kayleen Bryson. Um, I am a Sci community member. Whoop whoop, proud. Um, and I have been in the wine industry for about six years, something like that. Seven years. However old I am, I don't know. Um, I started off just doing like classes um, on tastings and history and geography and all that stuff. Um, and then I jumped over to a tasting room actually, the one that we share a wall with here actually. Um, I worked in that tasting room over there for a few years. Um, and now I am the enologist and um, I kind of assist in the winemaking at Big Basin Vineyards, um, which focuses on still wines and Rhone varietals. And that's who I am, and this is Barry Jackson, and he is um, sparkling wine wizard. Um, he's been doing sparkling wine making for about 20 years um, under Equinox Winery and contracting as well. Okay, um, and I do want to encourage you, um, please ask any and all questions. Like, this is the zone of no judgment. You can ask any question you want. Like, if you think it's dumb, I've probably asked it at some point. Um, and the only way you're going to know anything is if you ask questions. So please, please yeah. ask all the questions. We have a rule. Oh, we have a rule. Oh, shit. We have rules, guys. Shit. It, they're, they're good rules. <laughs> the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Um, so something that I wanted to ask um, and that I think is really interesting, because if you were looking at the stories earlier when we were promoting this, um, Barry made a comment that I really loved, um, essentially saying, in order to discuss the complexities of sparkling wine and the, and the oh, I'm also, thank you, I'm glad this is really informative, that's awesome. Um, when discussing sparkling wine, you have to consider it as a complete process from the vineyard all the way to the glass. Like, everything is fundamentally different. Um, and so the question I wanna uh, propose to you, Barry, um, is how does harvest date and vineyard management differ between sparkling wine grapes versus still wine grapes? And when I say harvest date, um, there is there's a time, and it's actually like right around the corner for some people, um, where you, you harvest your grapes. They come in off of the vineyard and you do stuff with them. And that whole time is called harvest. Um, and vineyard management is how 
you control how your vineyard looks throughout the whole year before you actually harvest your grapes. And so um, how does harvest date and vineyard management differ between sparkling wine grapes versus still wine grapes? Okay. Um, first of all, let me preface any remarks I have with um, what I know about viticulture I've learned from my friends and colleagues that know way more about it than I do. Yeah, uh, viticulture and winemaking, yeah. there's a lot of this, but there's also a lot of this. So, <laughs> so uh, from, a, from, from, from my standpoint, not being a viticulturalist, uh, the, the, the vineyard management is, is about uh, producing uh, fruit that's clean and superior and, and ready to be used for whatever end purpose it is. And so it's about uh, maintaining the, the health of the vineyard, uh, you know, avoiding any sort of uh, issues with, you know, mildew, rot, and things like that. And, and if any issues like that are at some sort of, you know, marginal degree uh, during the harvest, uh, those are sorted out. Uh, but that's, I would say, the same for still wine, though. It's, it's, it's yeah, the, from, the, from the vineyard management standpoint, uh, it's about bringing in uh, high quality fruit for, for winemaking purposes. Uh, from, from the harvest date aspect, <clears throat> uh, the, the principal difference uh, with sparkling wine versus still wines or table wines is that uh, we're picking the grapes substantially earlier. Like how much earlier? So the, the, the sugar levels in, uh, for, for still wines, and they're gonna range depending upon your variety, your vineyard location, the, the style of wine that you're trying to produce, but you're generally looking at a, a sugar level of say on the, on the lower end, 22 to 25 degrees bricks. And what is degrees bricks? Degrees bricks is roughly percent sugar. Uh, and the, the amount of sugar is going to translate into final alcohol in the finished wine. So, so if uh, you have grapes coming in at 24 bricks, what is your expected final alcohol by volume? Uh, it's probably going to be in the well up into the 14 and a half, 15 range. Okay. Uh, and there's different ways to deal with that. So, right. uh, and typically whites are picked a little bit less ripe than, than heavier reds. For still wine, so 22 to 25 degrees bricks uh, for still wine production. For sparkling wines, uh, we're looking at somewhere in the the 17 and a half to 20 degree bricks range. So substantially less ripe, lower yes. sugar, uh, higher acidity, much lower pH. So um, why do you have that much lower pH and much higher acidity? Uh, well, why, why is that a characteristic that you look for in grapes that you're harvesting for sparkling wine production specifically? Um, well, if we go back uh, to the, the mother wine, if you will, Champagne, as a model. Uh, That's our model organism here, Champagne. So the, the, historically, Champagne was the most northerly wine growing district in Europe. It was the last place to warm up in the spring. It was the first place to cool off in the fall. So the, the wines that were produced there historically before the advent of, of you know, the effervescent wines uh, were always lower in alcohol, higher in acid, kind of thin, tart. And it was actually, no one wanted to go there. Uh, yeah, for, it, for a long time, Champagne was actually the place you didn't want to get your wine from. Well, if you, if you, from a historical standpoint, if you look at the names of many of the Champagne houses that are, have been around for quite a while, they're Germanic. These were started by displaced Alsatians, and the oh. only place they could go was Champagne because no one wanted to go there because it was cold and, and a crappy place to make wine. Huh. And they persevered. Crazy. Bollinger. <laughs> I didn't know that. Krug. Right. I guess, yeah. Krug. Yeah. Duh. Duh. Bryson. Dutz. I mean, look at, look at you know, Heitzig. Look at, look at a right. bunch of the French Champagne houses. Yeah. You know, so. Runer? No, that's French. Yeah. Anyway. And, sorry. So. The, the model that Champagne evolved from were these lower alcohol, thin, high acid varieties. But those characteristics, when you do the second fermentation, give them some liveliness and some body. And so those are the, the, the attributes that we look for in sparkling wines. And another important aspect 
is if the alcohol in the base wine is too high, much, very much above 12 and a half, pushing 13, uh, there's a very good likelihood that the second fermentation will not go to completion, which is a stuck fermentation, which is always bad unless you're making late harvest Zinfandel, which you never set out to do in the first place. It's a damage control project. And the problem with a stuck fermentation in a method champenoise process is you don't have one stuck fermentation. You have several thousand stuck <laughs> fermentations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, when you're thinking about harvesting these grapes, you harvest them at lower sugar levels coming into the winery. Um, those sugar levels will eventually turn into alcohol. And if you need to put yeast in bottle again for your um, secondary fermentation to actually occur, if that alcohol level is too high, it's not permissive to a secondary fermentation. And then you just don't get bubbles. Um, which well, you don't get enough. You don't get enough. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the reasons uh, why we harvest champagne or sparkling wine grapes so fundamentally differently. Yeah, I mean, everything about producing sparkling wines is is a little bit different or completely different from producing still wines. So we're, we're, we're harvesting the grapes earlier. Okay, lower lower sugar, lower alcohol. Uh, and it, it's something that you, you, you test for, you plan for. Uh, another aspect of sparkling production is that the uh, uh, when we press the grapes off, we're pressing off uh, a lower yield. As as we press harder, we get more uh, we get more right. tannin, we get more astringency, right. and we're looking to avoid that because we're looking to make a, a fairly delicate uh, base wine. Right. One one aspect of the effervescence in any sparkling wine is that any any attribute of the wine is going to be accentuated. Uh, Why? Because the effervescence is taking any characteristic the wine has. If it's good, if it's got really nice aromas, it's going to push it out at you. Oh, make it more if, volatile? If there is any sort of uh, issue with the wine, if it's a little too astringent, uh, if it maybe doesn't have quite the aromatic character that you're looking for, the effervescence is going to push it out at you. Right. Um, uh, for a very, very brief period of time, I did some live theater. And so the effervescence in sparkling wine is like those horrid makeup mirrors that have lights <laughs> all around them. They're like, you look like this. And you're like, I know, shut up, mirror. Like, so <laughs> no. it's, it's, like, it's like the wind chill factor. It can be cold, and if it's still, it's not too bad. It can be 10 degrees warmer and windy, and you're freezing your butt off. So the effervescence tends to accentuate any attribute or limitation of the wine. And so Thanks, guys. <laughs> part of the, the, the process is making these very, very delicate, very clean uh, wines that we're then going to instill some effervescence in by a second fermentation. And then by aging in contact with the spent yeast, we're going to develop some flavors and aromas right. from the contact with the spent yeast. Right. Lees again. Um, so Gabe asked, is there any, is there a law that states that sparkling <laughs> wine not from champagne cannot be called champagne. So flipping that question around, is there a law that states that only sparkling wine from champagne can be labeled as champagne? Um, I forget the exact year that we signed whatever trade agreement it was that we gave up the right to use the term champagne, which was a legal term. Uh, we as in like we, United we States, as in or United, like we, we as in not champagne we as in the united states i can only talk for uh the labeling requirements put out by the uh the tax and trade bureau ttb formerly the bureau of alcohol tobacco and firearms before the homeland security thing in 2002. anyway in trade negotiations several decades ago the united states gave up the right to use the term champagne as a generic term although at the time it was a legal term, it was a statement of tax class going back to, oh, we get to charge you 20 times the tax rate of still wines because you have effervescence. They are kind of like tiny little bombs. So yeah, that. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the term uh, champagne was not allowed as a legal term unless you were grandfathered in and you had been using it for time prior to uh, the, the legislation going through. 
So are there still some wineries then in California that have been grandfathered in and can yeah. still call their wine champagne? Yeah. Well, that's just confusing as hell. Yeah. So that means that like half of the sparkling wine producers in California have to call it sparkling wine, and then like a subset of them can still call it champagne. Yeah. Well, well, that's, that's great for the consumer. How helpful. <laughs> well, you know, it was uh, it was a compromise. It was political. Yeah, it all goes No one's back. happy, so it must have worked. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, that is actually really cool. Um, and again, keep asking questions. I have a list of questions here for Barry as well, um, but I really want to hear your questions. And um, you're use, welcome, Gabe. <laughs> please use champagne as convenient verbal shorthand. I will reiterate it annoys my French friends. Yes, I call it sparkling wine, but I don't know. That's just like my personal little soapbox. Um, can you explain? Um, thanks, Dan. Um, so FYI, there are two primary kinds of champagne that you'll find available from most sparkling wine houses. Um, there's what's called non-vintage and then there's vintage champagne and they are fundamentally different. Um, and can you explain to, to everybody what the difference between a vintage and a non-vintage champagne is and then um, how you even make non-vintage champagne? Because okay. you've basically been describing vintage champagne. Well, I've been describing sparkling wines. Uh, the whole idea of, of a vintage wine uh, as it relates to still wines is there's good years and there's good years that are less good. Uh, as it, and so a vintage basically describes the year the grapes were grown and harvested and initially turned into wine. So an aspect of sparkling wine that developed champagne was uh, in really cold years the grapes wouldn't be as ripe. Uh, and so the, they developed a system where they would hold some of the older wine over to be blended in with the new wine, either to improve the new wine or to uh, blend away some of the older wine. And so I think the number in, in Champagne is something like 85% of the wine bottle in Champagne doesn't have a vintage date. And so they are blending primarily uh, one older vintage, maybe two older vintages with a current vintage and holding some of the current vintage back. And the idea is to, uh, they're eliminating some of the, the low points and maybe taking away some of the high points, but they're achieving a, a degree of consistency here in the middle. And so, Virtually all the larger champagne houses, uh, their, their entry-level wine, Moet, Chen, and White Star, uh, Mum, Cordon Rouge, uh, These are all, are all French houses, and they're they're uh, and they have California, uh, oh, yeah, right. they have oh, they yeah. have they have California counterparts, uh, but Champagne historically uh, was a non-vintage wine, and it's probably the only non-vintage wine that has any sort of uh, uh, marketability. You know, not putting a vintage date on a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon is pretty much the kiss of death. Yeah, that's sketchy as hell. <laughs> so uh, the, the blending to achieve a degree of consistency from year to year for the, the entry level and even maybe the next level of their non-vintage wines uh, was a, a, a process that developed in Champagne that allowed them to have consistency. If it's a vintage dated Champagne, most of it has to come from that year. Uh, and so uh, you see, you see non-vintage champagne, sparkling wines, you know, produced in California, uh, and it's uh, it's a way to uh, achieve consistency in the marketplace and uh, uh, and to account for the fact that historically that champagne growing region was so cold and a lot of vintages you wouldn't have. Oh yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't have the capacity to get fruit ripe enough to create a vintage champagne. Um, I actually have a question that isn't on any of these things, um, but do you see a rise in, or do you think there will be a rise with vintage champagnes and global climate change? Well, the, the you know, I follow some, some uh, articles, you know, on the internet, and a lot of the champagne houses have been adjusting their their viticultural protocols, and uh, they they've been harvesting earlier. In fact, they're mm. 
they're having probably their third harvest in in August in probably the last eight to ten years. Which and, is insane. August is really it's a pretty early harvest uh, for but that again, region. They're they're looking at grapes that are at lower sugar levels, right. and so when they're when they're when they're ready, they're ready. Uh, right. You know, you can. You know, the one the one thing about being a vintner is that uh, uh, <laughs> Mother Nature doesn't give tardy slips; she just screws you over. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh man. But yeah, it's it's easy to forget that winemaking is farming, basically. You're a really glorified farmer. Um, really quick, you were talking about sparkling wine in general. So someone asked, are you talking about French wines or Californian wines? Both. Plot twist. Um, we're talking about the sparkling wine method in general, and Barry focuses on the traditional champagne method of sparkling wine. Um, I want to answer a question really quickly. Someone asked, are champagne and sparkling wine the same thing? And this is going to lead into the next question, um, unless Gabe has a really slick question here. Um, uh, what wine are we sipping? So many questions. Yay, this is awesome. We have 10 minutes left. Now you got all these questions, homies. <laughs> um, so champagne and sparkling wine are not the same thing. Champagne is a type of sparkling wine, but you can also have Prosecco, which is from Italy. You can also have, um, which is made in a different method. You can have what's called uh, Petnat. Petnat is a natural, um, uh, I don't know how to really describe it, but it's, it's, it's your natural sparkling wine with uh, You're bottling, you're bottling. Yeah. A Petnat, Petion Natural, is a wine that's bottled towards the end of the primary fermentation. So you have some of the original grape sugar and you put that in a bottle and they typically use crowns and the primary fermentation finishes in that bottle and so you're you're capturing some of that that carbon dioxide from the the tail end of the primary fermentation and these wines are not as effervescent as sparkling wines and they're uh really nice ones are like they're hard to do uh is there a consistency issue with them well, there there can be until you figure out all the things you're supposed to do. We've we've uh, we've done a couple of uh, small projects with colleagues, and uh, there. Uh, let me just say that pet nats can be kind of messy. <laughs> yeah, delicious too, but messy. Um, oh my gosh, Gabe, I forgot what you asked already. Um, oh, if a wine is dry. By definition, it means it has zero grams per liter of residual sugar, um, but the the perception that consumers have of sugar is a little different. So anything below traditionally two grams per liter of residual sugar is considered dry to the consumer's palate. That doesn't mean it's actually dry. That means that it tastes dry, so it's perceived as dry. Um, and so there's two answers to that question. A dry wine has zero grams per liter of residual sugar in it. Um, perceptibly dry is below two grams per liter residual sugar. That's not gonna be on the label though. Um, no, I cannot share my phone number. <laughs> um, most, most, consume, most, most people, um, if, you, if you talk to taste physiologists, uh, they, they talk about what's called the threshold level. Mm -hmm. In most people, the threshold level for perception of sweetness is about five grams per liter. And that's where actually you start to perceive sweetness. As the sugar content goes up, the perception of sweetness increases. You can have sweetness levels below the threshold level, three grams per liter, four grams per liter, where you're gonna get viscosity, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a perception of increased fruitiness without actually having it uh, taste sweet. And this is where a lot of vintners uh, sort of try to uh, work the system. Uh, we, we make some sparkling wines that have uh, dosage levels that are sub-threshold, but they, they balance out the palate, they, they might maybe you know, balance out a little bit of uh, bitterness from some varieties. So uh, the, uh, the whole sweetness thing, you know, five grams per liter and above, it's going to taste sweet. Below that, it's fruitiness, viscosity, feel, viscosity, yeah. that sort of thing. 
Um, someone asked, we just have a few minutes left, so if you have any questions, get, get those questions in now. I finally learned to actually track the time on this, because the, the live thing is like, you have 30 seconds left, you're screwed. And you're like, oh my god. Um, so, um, does sparkling wine give you more of a buzz like it feels like it does? Well, on a hot day and it's cold, you can drink it faster. Uh, one thing that we do know from medical research is that uh, CO2 tends to inhibit the enzyme that breaks down alcohol in your blood. And Wait, say so that one more time? The, the sparkling wine, the CO2 in sparkling wine tends to inhibit the enzyme that breaks alcohol down in your bloodstream. Whoa. Which means it tends to stay in your bloodstream as alcohol a little bit longer. And if I'm if I recollect the article Holy correctly, crap. it it tends to have a slightly higher effect in women than men. You're shitting me. Uh, it's an article that I recall reading. Wow, that's actually really cool. I had literally no idea. Um, that's but pretty cool. The because that's the breakdown of alcohol to acetaldehyde, right? Yeah. That's the stuff you're talking about. Which, by the way, when you have a hangover, you typically have a hangover from acetaldehyde. Not alcohol. Well, and the other the other aspect of sparkling wine and giving you a buzz faster or not, uh, situational ambiance has a lot to do with it too. If you're partying and the wine is good, you're gonna knock it back a little bit <laughs> faster, maybe. Uh, we don't judge. Remember, this is a zone of no judgment. And remember, dry beverages, i.e., low or no sugar have less of a deleterious effect tomorrow uh, than sweeter ones. And lighter beverages versus darker beverages, ditto. Yep. So if you drink a completely dry Natur Blanc de Blanc sparkling wine versus say, I have a bottle of Yukon Jack, <laughs> you'll feel better <laughs> with the sparkling wine. That's very true. Yeah, Gabe, that's the reason for hangovers. It's the um, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase converts the alcohol, the ethanol, into acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is what's actually giving you a hangover. It's not alcohol. Or else you would have a hangover like as, as soon as you drank it, right? So it's the conversion of that alcohol into that acetaldehyde that causes you to want to just lay in your bed for forever and never leave. Um, so we are getting ready to close up. Um, Barry, uh, do you ship your wines outside of California or do people have to come to California to have your wines? Uh, we do ship out of state. I don't have the list in front of me, although we sell pretty much everything we make here at the winery. We have a handful of restaurants and wine bars in Santa Cruz uh, that sell our wine, and mostly because these are places I would go hang out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the wines are available to taste six days a week, and uh, we taste the new bubbles, the old bubbles. We have white wines, red wines, pink wines. A fantastic sparkling rosé, oh my gosh. And this beautiful 2001, which was Entourage for 15 years. Mm. You can also find information about the winery online, equinoxwinery.com, right? Uh, equinoxwine.com. Equinoxwine.com. Um, and if you are ever in the Bay Area, you can come hang out with us and drink sparkling wine with us. Um, please ship to Texas. Do you ship to Texas? Um, shipping shipping laws are really weird, by the way, in wine. Like you can't ship to certain states. Some are really expensive. Every every state is different. It's kind of annoying. We need it. We need a license to ship to Texas. And um, my most recent take on the shipping laws in Texas are they allow you to do it, but they make it so arduous <laughs> as to uh, want to just like gnaw an extremity off yeah. instead. Yeah. So uh, and it, that's, that's certain states are rough, man. That's, that's an issue to take up with your local representatives because Texas has a very strong distributor lobby and the distributor lobbies work on behalf of large producers and small wineries like ours and all of my neighbors, my friends and colleagues. We're ankle biters, we're a distraction, they hate us. Yeah. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, this was really awesome, super fun. Uh, the next episode of Enology Evenings is going to be on August 17th. I, I'm probably actually going down to Paso and interviewing Brian Farrell. Um, your phone went off like at the very end. Um, uh, interviewing Brian Farrell on the kinetics of fermentation Hi. and how those kinetics actually change as a function of vessel that they're in. 
Um, so I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight, and I hope you have an excellent white, white, that's wine and night, uh, and maybe have some sparkling wine as well. So I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.